Okay, we're going to go into the doctrine of prophecy uh, tonight. We're going to work right off of this first handout. There's a second handout if we have time to go into tonight, if we can, the doctrine of election. But I wanted to back up a little bit as we had taught on the doctrine of dispensations. And one of the things that we wanted to make clear, and that is that the importance of understanding God's policy. Because if I don't separate the policy of God from the character of God, then I will indict God meaning I will charge God falsely. Often when people look at the scriptures and they say, well, God was a God of vengeance in the Old Testament, or he was the God of judgment. And they look at that and they, they actually will say, they'll actually say, if that's what God is like, I don't want to serve a God like that. Okay. By the way, you and I are going to be facing um, a trend in Christendom that has a sizable audience and it has spokespersons. You know, I think that in no other time in history can someone who has a has an, a different point of view can get a platform to present that position. What do I mean by that? Well, back when things were written and printed on paper and, and that was the, the medium of communication, in other words, if anything had an authority, you got it published. You had a publisher. Okay. You had what was what would be called, you know, peer-to-peer -peer review. Your peers would review your work or your research before it would ever be published and become public information. Well, with the advent of the internet, that is no longer the case. Someone can literally post something on YouTube and it goes viral. And no one, you know, checks its, you know, its credentials or the the, tr the veracity of its source or any of that, you know, it's just like, you know, you can get a million or two million people to watch something, a video clip or something, and, and uh, all of a sudden that information is out there. <laughs> it's crazy. And so no longer is it that someone who has a, a very narrow you know, viewpoint will not, you know, can be heard today. Used to be that you, you know, you couldn't, you wouldn't hear their voices because they had no, no platform to communicate it. You know, there was no internet, there was, they didn't get published, people didn't read their stuff, or, you know, so forth and so on. So now we face <clears throat> this idea. So now there is a, there is a big question about can the God who is the God of love also be the God who created hell and damnation or, or uh, yeah, the lake of fire and all, all of which the scriptures teach. And, and they are, there are those who say, if that is that God, then I don't want to worship that kind of God. So they come up with another one that has the same language, meaning, you know, God is love and, and all of that. But they're not thinking the same way that we're thinking about that. And you're going to need to be able to, one, identify if, in fact, that's what's happening in that person's thinking. And secondly, how to, how to present the clarity of truth on that. And... Uh, because people, people will come up to you, you know, you get family members and say, yeah, well, I saw something on YouTube the other day, and there you go. And they did. 
And, uh, you know, it was something that uh, probably didn't need to be heard in the first place. So, but dispensations. And we said that, of course, we are in the church age and which is a most unique segment in God's economy. And it then becomes the focus not just for salvation. I think that uh, one, of the, one of the things that we also face, which is a disservice to the whole counsel of God, is that there's been so much of an emphasis on salvation. And, of course, there's nothing wrong with that, and we, of course, believe in salvation. But at the expense of discipleship, see? And discipleship is is part of the mission of any local assembly. That if, if, if a local assembly is healthy, it's not because of, you know, the size. This is the thing that, you know, we've been... Um, you know, we've been hypnotized and thinking that, well, this, this ministry must be effective. Look at the size of this ministry. You know, 14,000 people in the services. And it's not that what we're talking about can't happen there. It can happen there. But that's not how you want to measure it. Okay. Uh, in fact, you know, the saying really encapsulates this principle, and that is it's not how many you seat, it's how many you send. If I'm not sending anybody, I could fill up the seats Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and I'm not making disciples. But if people on a consistent basis are being sent, and that means that they are mature, they are disciples, and they in turn can teach others also. They are trained trainers. Then that church is healthy. That church is the church you'd want to be in, because otherwise it's, it's very convenient to add God to my schedule, whatever that might mean, my work, family, vacation, uh, leisure, uh, whatever time, and then, then kind of tack on a Sunday service along with maybe something during the week. But fundamentally, I don't open my Bible until then. And then maybe perhaps... If, if you put the verses up on the screen, I don't even have to bring my Bible. See? And uh, that can happen. Well, regardless of how that may appear, <laughs> hey, Jermaine. <laughs> Couldn't do either. By the way, you're also on the video. They, uh, they got you coming in. <laughs> Sneaking. <huh? laughs> so, um, shucks, where was I? Thank you. Making disciples and sending them. So, this is, this is the thing that... Uh, we will need to look at during the church age. Um, because Jesus Christ promised that he would do this, and he will break down the middle wall, the partition between Jew and Gentile. And by the way, that was a huge, huge wall. I, we, we talked a little bit about the fact that for the Apostle Paul to begin to say that that the Gentiles are partakers of the same promises as Israel, like would send a chill up somebody's spine, a rabbi's spine, that he would say that. But he did, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it was very powerful. But let's take a look at this <clears throat> pertaining to prophecy. And I want to premise it that many times we tend to think of prophecy in one dimension. We think of it as... Uh, foretelling, as we would look down the tunnel of time and see something that's happening somewhere in the future, and we're going to talk about it today. We're going to foretell. Before it happens, we're going to tell something about it. 
And that's the average viewpoint towards the use of this word for prophecy. But the other use, which has nothing to do with being a prophet or being uh, holding the office of a prophet, is when a person forth tells or he declares truth. And this word is also used in that context, that uh, when a person communicates truth that's from the scriptures and from the canon of scripture, the 66 books of the Bible, he is prophesying, but he's not, he's not forecasting the future or foretelling what, he sa- what is to be you know, experienced, but he's forth telling and declaring what is truth for people to be edified and to be built up in. But we want to look at this in, in terms of verse 6. So our sheet here, uh, the doctrine of prophecy, uh, and we'll jump right into this. First and foremost, when we approach prophecy, we should understand that the Bible has no hidden codes or limited to fortune telling. Prophecy is not limited to forecasting or foretelling. When it does, the emphasis is important because it is always about the person of Jesus Christ. I shudder when I, you know, people have prophecy about other people. Okay? Or they have prophecy about nations. You know that there's, uh, there, there probably is more, but there was a list of 74 existing websites on the internet that were solely and completely dedicated to biblical prophecy meaning these guys are the guys that are looking they're looking at the bible they're looking at the weather they're looking at the bible they're looking at economics they're looking at the bible they're looking at politics and they're looking to try to link something that's in the bible with something that's happening contemporarily and to try to set the clock as to when Jesus Christ is coming back. Now see, that's been done before. <clears throat> and then when the clock ticks 12 and nothing happens, see, nobody has the moxie to blow the whistle on that and say that's not even supposed to happen anyway. Hmm. Not in the what? Church age. Because within the context of the church age and understanding dispensationally, dispensationally what we are all about is that we are the last card played until the rapture. We are, we are what God is doing, and then he will return back to addressing Israel as a nation. So we are God's agenda, the church age, and the, and the ecclesia, the, the, the called out ones. And if prophecy has anything to say, has something to say about Jesus Christ, and now within the church age, we're talking about the body of Jesus Christ, the local assemblies that make up and constitute the, the body of Christ. So, uh, so there's like 74 of these websites, and I mean to tell you, like they're not, you know, they're not simple. They're very elaborate, and you know, you, in other words, I kind of think that. Most of this is a momentum test to a believer who's fascinated by the Bible but is not a student about the Bible. They're fascinated. Oh, yeah. How many of you remember, you know, when I first got saved, of course, like most folks did, you read Revelations first. You know, like, you know, I'm, I want to find out how's this thing going to end, you know, and then you got, you know, lambs and vials and, you know, and all this. Is, whew, and you are like, <laughs> and uh, gospels. What's that all about? You know, like. <laughs> so there are, there are, there is a lot of activity in this realm, and quite frankly, we just need to like pull back, you know, the the undergrowth that's out there, and really just get to what we were supposed to be about pertaining to our father's business in the church age. So it must be that it's always about the person of Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is truth and 
He is the Word of God. Then we have two premises on prophecy. Number one, veracity or truth is confirmed by prophecy. Notice that, please. The Scriptures are confirmed by the fulfillment of prophecy. They are not determined to be true by prophecy. There's a huge difference. Jesus said, if you do not believe what I'm saying, then believe in the works that I do because they speak of me. But I am who I am. I don't need a, a prophetical confirmation. You know, the, the fact that Jesus Christ could, you know, performed many miracles was out of compassion. And then there, was a then there were specific miracles that were called signs. Signs meaning they determined that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was in fact the Messiah. And that was the big question that was on most minds during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, is that is he really who he says that he is? Well, he says who he is, and then the, the prophecies only confirm it. They don't determine it. Because see, what the Antichrist will do, he'll get that the other way around. He'll come in with signs and wonders and, and a lot of hocus pocus and everybody will say, he's the guy. And they never checked his genealogy, his driver's license. <laughs> never asked for it. But they're impressed because he, he has the, this miraculous ability and this amazing approach and answers and, and, and everything, he's got to be our Messiah. Well, he is. He's the anti-Messiah. So it's important that we understand that prophecy only confirms what is already true. And if, and if God didn't say anything but what he says in his word, that's sufficient for us. All right? Now, the Bible is the Word of God. And when a prophecy is foretold and comes to pass, it reveals the supernatural truth of the Bible. It is important to see if the passage was inspired by God, there are many false scriptures and false prophecies. Again, we mentioned in the point number two is it was all about the person. Prophecy identifies him as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. People get fascinated with the end times and miss the person of Jesus Christ. When the Bible reveals truth, it will be about Christ. Okay? Now, let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 13, and we'll see this very beautifully. John 13. Now, I want, you to, I want you to think of this because this is, uh, this is an interesting principle as it relates to prophecy within the time frame of the one who says it. In other words, we're going to say something and it's going to come to pass while I'm still around, not 700 years later. So he says, uh, Jesus is speaking, he says, I speak in verse 18, not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now, what is the Lord saying here? This has already been prophesied, okay, but it's going to come to pass right now or within my lifetime. Right now, it's going to come to pass. But he says this in verse 19, and this is very interesting. Now I tell you before it come, that when it comes to pass, you may believe that what? I am. That you may believe that I am. Because up to this point, he said who he was, but they didn't believe what he said. 
Now he points to the scriptures of a prophet who forecasted thousands of years ago what was about to happen to Jesus Christ. So what is that? That only confirms what he's already said. And even with that, they would not believe. I tell you, there's a real mystery. There's a real mystery, the mystery of unbelief. It is, it is huge. It is huge. I think of the fact that you know, we, can, we can say that we can believe something, and we can, but, but when a person goes negative towards Jesus Christ or the Word of God, I don't know if they know how difficult it may be to be able to pull that back up and turn and turn that around. Um, you know, Thomas, when he was negative, all right, he 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 was he was upset. Okay, and so he didn't come to that first post-resurrection service gathering that they had, and Jesus showed up. And so all the disciples didn't go back to Thomas. He was there. And he said, yeah, unless I can see the nail prints and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. I will, volitional decision, not believe. I'm hearing what you're saying, guys, and I respect you and I love you, but I because of what? Anger. There was something else that was going on in Thomas's heart. All right? And that had to be dealt with. So now, when Jesus Christ saw him, he said first to Thomas, come, touch my hands. Put your hand on my side. Okay? And be believing. It's an it's a, it's a active participle. Start now, Thomas, to believe. And you know, the beautiful thing is that he went, you know, he just worshiped. He just broke out into worship, my Lord and my God. Just because it was all there anyway. But anger or, or, you know, disappointment or frustration turned him negative towards believing the, the, the other disciples' report. Now, so Jesus says, I tell you these things before it comes, that when it comes to pass, you may believe. Uh, then over to John chapter 14, and here we see verse 29. Same setup. But here, he is speaking not to the general public, not to the pharisaical naysayers. He is speaking now to his own disciples. And it's beautiful because this is a very intimate time. Verse 25, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I live, leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than, than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. So now he is saying, I am telling you these things 
because he knew, number one, when he said that he was going to go away, the disciples didn't want that to happen. Secondly, he said, and it's, and it's, it's pictured here, he says, <clears throat> verse 28, I go away and come again unto you. So here's two points, and we could, we could, we could amplify this because there's many times in which prophecy, the prophet kind of telescopes time, okay? He sees, like if, if you know, if I was uh, in a mountain range and, and I looked and I could see one range of mountains and then further off in the distance I see another range of mountains, they kind of look, you know, collapse close together. Okay, uh, I, I can't tell, I couldn't see that there might have been this large valley in between those two ranges, all right? But there is. Um, what's that big mountain out in, uh, in uh, Washington State? Is it? Yeah, okay. I remember seeing, seeing it, okay? And uh, I said, wow, that, that, that's a big mountain. I mean, it really, you know, you got, you got other mountains there, and then you've got this thing that just like, <laughs> it just is up there. You know, it's like huge in comparison to other mountains. But the fascinating thing was like I said, hey, let's, can we go there? You know, I want to go there. <laughs> it was so stinking big, it was three hours away. I mean, it looked like it was right there, you know, like 20 minute drive, you're right there, you know. And, and I couldn't believe that. And then the perspective came in, okay. And so sometimes we're going to, you know, like a, a, a prophet will see like the first advent of Jesus Christ. And then he'll see behind that the second coming of Jesus Christ. But they kind of look like they're together. And he'll say, he'll say, we'll see the illustration of this, he'll say it in one sentence. Okay, and what Israel didn't realize was that sandwiched in between those two major events was the church age. Okay, down in the valley, hidden. Okay, yes, the first advent and then the second advent, and then but down in here is where <laughs> there's a huge span of time in history, in human history, is going on. So. Here's Jesus saying, I have told you these things today. Next week, it's going to happen. Next week, I'll be crucified. Next week, I will go away. I will be crucified. But then I'm going to come again afterwards. So it's, it was interesting because there's no, there was no mystery, per se. You know, what Jesus Christ what was going to happen to him was no mystery to the disciples. It's just that they couldn't put it together in their heads. They couldn't put it together and see that this was something that had to be fulfilled and had to take place. Uh, and Jesus Christ did all that he said that he would do for the purpose that they would continue to believe. And this is what we want to see. Um, Prophecy is that a person will believe, not get saved. You say, but you have to believe in order to be saved. Yes, but that's not the reason why the prophecy is given. Okay? I mean, you know, here's somebody that says this. Uh, how do, how, anybody here, how do, you, how do you believe that Noah's Ark is real? How do you believe that Noah's Ark is real? The Bible. The Bible. Just the Bible? Okay. What do you? Yeah, right. Now, what if they could go up on Mount Ararat and bring back a piece? A piece of Yeah. What would that do for you? 
what you already believe. But you didn't need that to believe, did you? No. Yeah, you make some money, but it's, yeah. it's a tourist attraction. Come and see the ark right here. It's, it's, it's reenactment. That's right. We'll have uh, somebody dressed up like Noah. You know, just. But isn't it interesting that people would say, you know, and this is what they said about the, the, the Shroud of Turin, and they've, they've spent a lot of time and a lot of money on this thing. And, you know, this is the, supposedly the burial cloth of Jesus Christ, you know. And boy, if they could really prove that, then they scientifically and present that, oh man, people would just like believe, right? Because faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing the word of God. And never, never, you know, and again, when we think of the fact that someone could come up with the idea that, you know, they have prophetically figured out who the Antichrist is. Well, I don't need, quite frankly, I don't even know who he is. I know he will be. But I also know that I won't be here when he's here. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no substantiation of, of faith. It's just that prophecy confirms what already is true. And where did that truth come from? Veracity from a person named Jesus Christ, from the Word of God. Okay. And never should the twain get turned around where somebody says, boy, you know, um, Think if we could find the Ark of the Covenant. See, you got archaeologists that there are cities that are mentioned in the Word of God that they haven't found on the map anywhere. So they say the Bible is not true. Why? Because it's talking about a city that's not even there. We haven't found it. Well, where are you resting your authority on? On your archaeological expertise, you know, your ability to find these cities. Well, come to find out that there were a number of those that they said only later on to come and discover that the Bible account was true in the first place. They said, oh, we found a city over here. We never knew there was one here, <laughs> you know, but the Bible said it was there. Oh, well, that just so happens to be. So this is a very important principle for us, which is what is which is why I think that the whole, the whole focus on prophecy is a big distraction. Because you know why? I could spend decades studying it and not get the rest of the counsel of God. See? I could be a pr prophetic major and have, have a, amazing insight into Israel and, and, uh, and all of the symbols and in the book of Revelation, and, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't evangelize. <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I'm dis disconnected. I'm, I'm absorbed by it. Actually, I'm consumed by it. And that, for any of us, you know, something that seems so appropriate and, and relevant ends up becoming a major distraction and gets us off track. So, uh, prophecy can be, excuse me, one of, those, one of those matters. Okay, let's turn to Matthew tw chapter 24. And this is, this is probably one of those passages where... All of the Bible pundits really go to. In order to. Get a scope on what what they view as world history. OK. Now. Verse 4, Jesus says this, Take heed that no man deceive you. One of the interesting elements within the New Testament, now that we have the canon of Scripture 
which is closed. It's 66 books of the Bible. Now that we have the fulfillment of the law through the person of Jesus Christ, now that we have what we see dispensationally identified as the church age, prophecy now takes on an entirely different view or different role. Because, yes, in the Old Testament, there were false prophets. But when a prophet <coughs> prophesied falsely, what was the last thing written on his resume? Stoned. <laughs> that was it. You know, he, he was gone. And that's how that was dealt with. But you guys, you know, we, we, have, we have a guy can get on the television and start putting up billboards on the, on the street corner and, you know, paint vans and hold up placards on 95 and, you know, give the date of when it's all over, all over. And the minute that date pass, nothing happens to the guy. I mean, you know that. No, there's nobody that's going to take him out in the corner like they used to and stone that guy. Okay? So that leaves then prophecy in that fashion as in the New Testament, it is something that Jesus said, in these days there will be false prophets. And so don't let anyone what? Deceive you. Deceive you. And the Lord wouldn't say it if it couldn't be possible. All right. So I mean, as I sit here, think I said, I, I, I don't, I don't even go for that stuff. You know, and everything like that. Well, somebody in your family may. Okay. Someone that you love may. And then you need. We need to understand how significant that can work against. Them. So he says, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. Uh, I, I, from time to time, I get spammed by emails, you know, and... Uh, Someone was trying to connect the earthquake and the, and the following tsunami in Japan with God judging them. Because at some time, they, they pulled up some obscure article where uh, supposedly uh, there was some, uh, uh, you know, a missionary thrust and they rejected the missionaries. <laughs> you know. This should have been rejected for 2,000 years now. It's not a new thing. But they, they got consumed with trying to connect, to authenticate something that happened in history with something that, you know, God was supposedly now doing in history as this big sign and this big wonder, and everybody's going to go, ooh. And they're distracted. And we could say that if it perpetuates itself, they become deceived. I say, yeah, wow, I never thought of that. Uh, how many remember what, what the Da Vinci Code? Okay, what was that all about? It's good, you don't hardly know. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, like there's, you know, you, you know the, the, uh, the portrait of... Uh, of the, you know, the Last Supper, you know, like who, you know, there's somebody in there, you know, like, I mean to tell you, there were like people who got obsessed with that. But interestingly, there were people who got obsessed with the obsessors. <laughs> and they were saying, you know, like, this whole thing is, is not of God, you know, and, you know, like as if like the devil was doing, you know, all this promoting of the Da Vinci Code and everything like that. And Dan Brown was just making it to the bank. Selling book after book after book after book, and then, you know, Hollywood movie and all of that. So, so anyway, but what was that? It was just a distraction. 
It was like I, I, I'm, I'm in the will of God, I'm walking in the plan of God, I'm obedient to Jesus Christ, I'm having fellowship with him, and all of a sudden something out here goes, kah, 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 and I, you know, like what's that all about, you know? And it's going to happen again and again and again, all right? And so the Lord says, but you know, don't be troubled. It, wars? Yes. Rumors of wars? Yes. You know, somebody said that uh, this was on one of those prophetic, uh, pathetic, uh, prophetic uh, websites uh, that in the next few weeks, this is, this is very interesting, in the next few weeks it's going to be determined that Israel will have to attack Iran because of the nuclear program that they have. And when they do so, that will now trigger click, 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 click. You know, like they just had it all, all marked out like dominoes. You know, one thing will fall, and the next thing, next thing, and next thing. And you know, like you're looking at this thing like, wow, I never saw that. It's amazing, fascinating. Yeah. And consequently, so now you got people that are, you know, focusing in on, you know, this rumor that, you know, war could happen, you know, the next 14 days, according to this guy. Well, this guy probably never would have had a platform if there, was the, if there wasn't the internet. So you wouldn't even know who he was or what he was all about, but now he's got the platform, and he's able to get it out there, and so he's running his game. And so this is the thing, that people get troubled. They get disturbed. They get derailed from what they were involved with. They get unsettled, and they, you know, they, they begin to question, like, well, if that were to happen, then, then maybe this wouldn't be true. This couldn't be true, because if, you know, if Israel was you know, involved in that, there you go, all right? So Jesus just said, hey, don't be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Well, World War I was declared to be the war to end all wars. Now, I don't know quite who said that or what their perspective was, but the fact of it being that it was, it was probably the first technologically driven war that the world ever had. Meaning, uh, people, people got killed based upon not the size of the army, but the technology that they possessed. And that's, that kind of has set the premise, World War II was the same way. And then, you know, of course, here we are in the nuclear age, but, but the point being is that when they came out of that war, and the way they wanted to set up political relationships you know, Germany was, was put on its heels and chastised for you know, a lot of things, and they, and they tried to, you know, prevent that. So this would never happen again. Now, if we were living in that day, and we heard that, uh, you know, according to, you know, the leading governments, that we are establishing policy so that this kind of horror will never happen again. And we could say, that would be great if it wouldn't, but it will. You say, what do you mean, it will? We, will, we don't want that to happen. Well, no, 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 the Bible. You see, you got to read the Bible. <laughs> you know, wars, plural. Rumors of wars. And so it's very interesting that, that man, he, 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 he just walks right past the revelation of the scriptures, makes a declaration about something that he says will never happen again, and it does. And it does. Maybe he doesn't have an answer for that. Uh, but look at verse 11. And how many? Many false prophets shall rise. Many. So I think we could understand that during the church age and during this time, there's going to be a lot of traffic just a lot of traffic. And the great thing that we have 
is that we have the Word of God to be our focal point. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ to be our security. We have the Holy Spirit who has sealed us, and we have this reality. And so when things do happen as they will historically, we don't go running off and getting occupied with it as much as we put it in the context of reality according to the scriptures. And that's going to be key. That's going to be very, very important. All right. Now, I went ahead and included uh, some prophetic uh, passages. This is uh, by virtue of uh, Wilmington's Guide to the Bible which I would encourage if anyone's going into pulpit ministry, you want to get a copy of this, whether electronically or otherwise. Um, but he just, you know, he just outlines this, and this is pretty straightforward, um, how that the prophecy in the Old Testament zeroed in on the person of Jesus Christ fulfilling the office of Messiah. So any self-respecting Jew could look at what the prophets had said and say, does this guy fulfill this or no? And if I, and if I had a negative attitude towards you, if, you know, if I, don't, I, don't, I don't like Jesus. I don't like it the fact because he comes from a little town called Nazareth. You know? So he came from my hometown. Well, you could have a problem that way, but can you deny what the scriptures say? And the answer is no. You can't with any clear conscience. Uh, just take a look at, um, let's see here. There was one that... I was enjoying here. Okay, Hosea 11.1. Under the Old Testament, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Now, what is Hosea talking about? Well, this is one of those prophetical statements that is looking down at the tunnel of history and saying something about the Messiah having to come out of Egypt. Now that right there seems to be impossible. Impossible. Why? How could, how could Israel's Messiah be in Egypt? How, how could that happen? Well, see, now we can see and understand that what happened was that, you know, when Herod was killing the babies, then Mary and Joseph fled. They were told by an angel to move out, and they did. And where did they go? They went to Egypt, see? And back in Hosea's day, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't imagine what was that all about. Like he's stating something that doesn't have a possible reference in his personal experience as a prophet, but did it not come to pass exactly as God said? Yes. And you know what's interesting is that, is that what means was employed to get Mary and Joseph to flee? A pretty horrific event. Okay. We could say that's, that's pretty amazing, that it was going to be the slaughter of babies, but that was prophesied as well, all right? And so things begin to line up as to who this Jesus of Nazareth really is according to the fulfillment of Scripture. Okay? For instance, look on uh, Isaiah chapter... I, I don't have these pages numbered, so let's see. The back side of a page, let me see, one, two, okay? Let's 
Top of the page, Isaiah 53, and verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. You know, one of the great difficulties for the Jewish mind was as they looked on the landscape, prophecy, and they saw uh, the Messiah's first coming, but then they saw greater behind that his messianic fulfillment in the kingdom, in the brand new, in the kingdom age. And that seemed to be much more glorious and much more powerful that they got occupied with that and missed or didn't pay much attention to this this same one who now was going to come and be a suffering Messiah, was going to be a lamb, not the lion. The lion comes later, but the lamb of God. Excuse me. And this is what this is saying here in Isaiah 53, because... Isaiah the prophet, he sees this one and he's bearing the griefs and carrying the sorrows. And then he says right out there that we would not esteem him or Israel would esteem him not stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He would literally appear as if God was judging him. And isn't that true? that when Jesus Christ was on the cross and and when he was bearing our sins, that was the only time, instead of calling him Father, he called him my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Because the sin now was separating the Father from the Son. Sin now was what was being born upon his precious body, and the language changed. But that wasn't the last thing that he would say. And when Jesus Christ gave up the Spirit, into thy hands. I commend my spirit. He was quoting Psalm 31. He just said it, and there it was. And it's amazing that we get a very clear, lucid report from the cross. It is amazing. I mean, who was there? Well, yes, some of the disciples there, Mary, Magdalene was there, and, but you got a picture, I mean, that like incredible chaos, incredible in, emotional intensity, and things just going on that are just like seemingly spinning out of control. And yet, in the midst of that, Jesus Christ is still confirming and fulfilling prophecy about himself. It's, it's, it's the most unique time in human history crucifixion apart from the resurrection I just you know I, I just I get caught up in that I, I get I get amazed at that 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 Jesus Christ in the midst of all that was going on was perfectly fulfilling prophecy and perfectly fulfilling the plan of God so that he would there be no question See, when there's no question because of the evidence, then one has to live in denial. And this is the thing that's important, that no one goes to hell by mistake. They have to, and they will come to the place where they will deny what is obviously an evidential fulfillment of truth. And that's where prophecy comes in. It it confirms what's already true, but you cannot say that... uh, that the Lord did not 
you know, fulfill all the prophecies related to his messianic office, because he did. And it's an amazing thing. All right. Now that's all we have to do with the doctrine of prophecy. There is, uh, we're going to take a short break and then come back and you can pick up um, the, the next handout on the doctrine of election. I'm going to finish up a little bit on the prophetic doctrine when we get back and then we'll go right into <coughs> right into that prophecy, and just in case you may have forgot, I've got 20 after. Let's meet back here at 20 of 8. That gives us 20 minutes, okay? And those folks will meet right here at, um, just in this area in the cafe. Thank you very much. <coughs>